everybody. Video here for you today, some ancient history news. Now, originally, I was going to do these every Monday, but now, whenever I come across an interesting story, I'll make a little clip about it. And then once I have five of them put together, I'll upload a video. So these could come at any time. There could be three days in between these or 10 days. But today, we're going to talk some ancient history news. We're going down to Barry Pomeroy in England here. Barry Pomeroy is the location of this find in the article. But there is a larger city. What is this, Pankton over here? Just to the east. But there was a little bit of work done up here by a amateur archaeologist, I think. And there is a hill up here. But I think he did some amateur LIDAR work and find was made right down here. He concentrated in this area right here. I want you to look at the circle of trees right here. Let's strip away the vegetation. Here is a LIDAR pick. There you see clear evidence of a circular fort that probably dates back to the Bronze Age. Let me just read here. It says, amateur archaeologist and photographer Darren Murray believes he has discovered two hidden ancient monuments during lockdown by using his local knowledge and a new type of laser light technology. The county archaeologist is now looking into the find. Darren, a well-known local photographer from Brixham, says there are two previously undiscovered Bronze Age hilltop forts on the outskirts of Pankton. Says he used a LIDAR computer program, which is Trace Loss Mayan Pyramids. It works by revealing in 3D the shape of the ground beneath the trees. So that's a pretty cool story. I will leave all these links below, but that is Devon Live. And there is, look, this lost hilltop fort discovered by LIDAR. Let's move on. Next story, we're going down to Norway here. And they are jackhammering out by the pool here today. The pool's been closed all spring. Now they're jackhammering out there. Hope that it doesn't affect the sound in this video, but we are going down to Alverson today in Norway. This looks like a pretty beautiful part of the world here. Here is Alverson right down on the waterway here. This looks like a real beautiful part of the world here. Water all around. I'm sure a lot of fishing is done up here. Let's just read what was found down here. Here's a brand new story, Let the Dice Roll, 1,700-year-old board game found in early Iron Age Norwegian burial mound. Here are what they say are game pieces, you notice little circles on the items there. It says, board games of this kind indicate broad contacts with the Roman Empire, researchers say. Game chips and dice have been found in an early Iron Age tomb in northern Horland, Norway. The discovery dates from the early Iron Age, roughly around 300 AD in the burial mound near Alversund in the municipality of Alver in connection with the plot development. A total of 13 whole and five broken game chips were unearthed complete with a die or dice. Also included in this article was this runestone depiction. They say it's people playing a board game coming from over 1,500 years ago. I will leave this link below. It says the chips are marked with numbers in the form of dots and are valued 0, 3, 4, and 6. In total, fewer than 15 artifacts of this kind were previously found in Norway. Game pieces, maybe a connection to the Roman Empire, maybe to Caesar and his pals. Let's move on. From Norway, why don't we head on over to, why don't we go to Egypt? Why not? Pretty interesting little tiff developing here. I'm just going to report on this briefly, but Zahi Owas, I reported on him weeks ago. Let's see what Zahi's up to. Now, here is a link, and I followed this story last week mainly, but I guess it's still going on, and it's been a back and forth, and it's just really Zahi being Zahi. But it's a, it says, Egypt's former Grand Mufti responds to critique by Zahi Owas, and Zai had some things to say after after the media asked him about comments made, I believe, on a TV show by the Grand Mufti. So I'm just going to read a little bit of the article. If I mispronounce some of these words, forgive me. It says, Ali Goma, member of the Council of Senior Scholars of Al-Azhar and the former Grand Mufti of Egypt, issued a statement in response to criticisms made by the former Minister of Antiquities, Zai Yawas, 
Hawass had criticized Gomaz's comment made during the program Egypt, the Land of Prophets, that it might have been the Islam Islamic prophet Idris who taught the ancient Egyptians how to build the pyramids and that the Sphinx was built in his honor. And uh, Idris seems to be the same thing the Greeks call Hermes, the Egyptians call Thoth, Enoch from the Hebrews, it seems to be all the same thing. Omas said in a statement that his old friend Hawass had not called or seen the program himself and had not verified what was said, but instead relied on what had been circulated by the media. <laughs> Way to go, Zai. Here is article. The Grand Mufti responds to Zai Hawass. Here is this article. Zai Hawass refutes the former Grand Mufti. And sometimes things that we believe in are called different names by different cultures or civilizations and sometimes we argue our arguments are pointless this seems kind of a silly argument zahi didn't even hear what he originally said he was just going by what people thought and why do we have such disagreements we should be concentrating on new discoveries bringing new information forward but zahi will always be zahi i guess why don't we stay in egypt for the next story celebrating life amid grief and death the ancient egyptians have much to teach us about the ethereal uncertainty we are all facing this is written by sarah parsak and i know a lot of you are familiar with her from her google earth work finding ancient monuments under the sands of egypt and i believe she has used other radar technologies in egypt but this story just kind of grabbed me today she talks about her current times and the ancient egyptians view of life and death this is dated May 1st, and Sarah writes in this editorial here, We do a terrible job with facing death and grief, and we feel it daily in the face of so much fear and loss during the global pandemic. I am surrounded by death with my archaeological work in Egypt. And Sarah just goes over how we are spending our time at home on Zoom and listening to music and on social media and sharing sourdough recipes. The Egyptians have much to teach us in this present moment when, ironically, our homes feel more like well-stocked tombs for eternity than anything else. On March 10th, I left on my last overseas trip to London and then India for meetings. As soon as I landed in London, I heard the government of India had canceled all visas. During the scramble to rebook tickets, it struck me that this trip was goodbye to our old world. I was in a liminal space between past and present, floating as a witness to a rift in time. It seemed appropriate to pay a final visit to my dear Egyptian friends at the British Museum, the Rosetta Stone, Ramses II, and the mummies on the third floor. Now, I'm not going to read the full article here, but I will leave the link below. Just goes on here. Their entire montage is so vivid, so real. One forgets the artists created these scenes for eternal rest, and yet that's the irony. The Egyptians are so well known for mummies and tombs and grave good, but it was life they honored in their tombs. They didn't appear to be mawkish about it, just practical and hopeful, and they would have people in their mortuary cults to make offerings to their life forces in perpetuity. In tomb reliefs, the colors are bright, the figures handsome and well-proportioned, all people in the fullness of strength, beauty, and grace. I felt overwhelmed by joy as I stood there, feeling the crushing weight of longing for a world that I knew would become an archaeological relic, yet buoyed by the knowledge we still find so much that our humanity has not changed in 3,500 years. It is the ambiguity of the celebration of life amidst death where I find so much hope right now. I've learned that tombs in ancient Egypt are time machines taking us back and pushing us ahead to comfort our own mortality, as well as giving us renewed gratitude for all the time we are gifted here amidst so much art and love. I cannot tell you how long I stood in front of Nebimun's reliefs, finding my way to acceptance for whatever might come. Nebimun had gifted me heightened perception, and a month later, I feel so ever much more alive when I walked into the museum transformed by the hands of ancient artisans. It says, we all exist now in the ether, neither here nor thereness of awaiting the unknown. 
It is a form of purgatory, and the hundred daily griefs can compound into our inability to move or function. However, the force that can allow motion through time of an in-between is in the very actions that have bound humanity since our very beginning some 300,000 years ago. Beats of music, smells of cooking, seeing dance, hearing stories. Our senses are our new survival superpowers during this time of pause. We are becoming tomb figures, dancing, singing, and feasting our way around death. And despite it, the ancient Egyptians would have approved and told you, keep on no matter what, but perhaps leave out a little offering of your sourdough bread for their spirits in gratitude. Now, last story, why don't we go down to ancient America, Ohio. In the olden days, I used to get pretty opinionated on YouTube, and voice my thoughts whenever I wanted. Now, eh, I really don't care. I see so much stuff that I just disagree with on YouTube. It would just be a waste of time. But I do get opinionated at times, especially when I'm offended. And I will keep on being opinionated when things really get to me. But let's talk about Ohio, the Mound Builders, what was written recently. When looking around for stories, this one kind of caught my eye. Archaeology Saga of Giant Mound Builders is a tall tale that won't go away. Since this was written by the curator of archaeology at the Ohio History Connection, I was definitely interested to see what new information or anything he had to say. Maybe I'd learn a few things. I will leave this link below also. It says charlatans are still trying to strip American Indians of their heritage by claiming some mysterious lost race of white people, giants or aliens, built Ohio's ancient earthworks. I don't think anybody has ever commented on one of my videos that aliens built these earthworks. It seems I can no longer give a public program about Ohio's amazing ancient American Indian mounds without someone in the audience asking me about giants or lost tribes of Israel or even aliens. He goes on to write, ironically, there actually was a government conspiracy to cover up the truth about who really built Ohio's mounds. Jason Calavito shares his story in his new book, The Mound. Milder Myth, Fake History, and the Hunt for a Lost White Race. And that's really not the issue with these mounds. I mean, some people might think this way or that way. Now, it's really interesting how Jason Calavito dodges around the real question. He associates these mounds to current tribes in the Ohio region. Says it's all a cover-up because they didn't want you to know that the Indians built these. They wanted to discredit the Indians. Well, how many of my videos have I mentioned? Even the native tribes say this is from a lost race. And these are sacred grounds. He goes off on the alien and lost white race tangent, but dodges the real question that I have brought up. He associates them to current tribes in Ohio. Jason Calavito has no thought process. Nothing extraordinary ever happened. Glaciers move at a faster rate than his thought process. I have challenged him to a debate, and I still will, about some of the things he have written because they are absolutely ridiculous. I know a lot of you are familiar with Michael Shermer from his performance on the Joe Rogan experience when he debated Graham Hancock. That'll give you a real good idea of into how these skeptics really think and how uneducated they are. Jason Colavito is a skeptic. Pretty well-known one, and I laugh. But I'd like to thank Bradley Lepper here, the uh, curator of Ohio History Connection, for returning my email earlier today. We talked about a few things. He he is crediting Jason Calavillo with the best explanation of the history of this place, and I told him my exact thoughts. My exact thoughts. He says there was no... People found over seven feet tall, even though I've read direct documents from the Smithsonian, right from their books. I don't know. This seems a little bit weird to me. The curator of Ohio History Connection is attributing these mounds to recent tribes and recognizing no lost past, even though, even though they go back thousands of years. He says, well, DNA connects them to the native tribes around here today. Yeah, well, great. Kennewick man found, what, 9,000 years old and relate them through DNA to native tribes in that area. It doesn't connect the cultures one damn bit. He suggested to me that I read his book so I can get educated on the history of Ohio. 
Well, of course, I suggested he watch my videos so he can get a little more up with speed on the real history of the Ohio Mound Builders. That'll wrap up my video. I think I've said enough. Hope you thought that was cool, and you all have a very safe day.